So in part one, we touched on the first Baldwin motion car ever, the 67 Camaro. Well, this was how the whole process worked. First, buyers would go to Baldwin Chevrolet and place their order for an SS 396 Camaro. Being an SS, this would ensure many of the heavy duty performance parts like brakes and suspension were already done. John Maller, the parts manager at Baldwin Chevrolet, would ensure the 427s and whatever else Joe would need would be available. Upon delivery, the car and motors would be sent to Motion Performance where it would get the SS 427 Phase 3 treatment. Joe would rip out the 396s and do the 427 swaps, throw on some unique body modifications like Corvette hood scoops, and then send them out the door, all done with GM factory warranties and General Motors financing. Oh, and let's not forget the famous 1150 at 120 mile per hour, quarter mile guarantee. So in a nutshell, the plan was, order a performance car from Baldwin, motion rips out the factory motor, drops in a 427 with some bolt-ons, and tunes it, sprinkles on some aggressive bodywork so that the car strikes fear to the factory cars it beats in the street, and sell it for a nice profit. Not bad. Now Martin Shore from Cars Magazine comes in with his advertising know-how, throws a little gasoline on the fire, advertising with lines like, the quickest and fastest supercar, SS 427 Camaro, Dino Tune and Ready to Whale for 3650 gets Chevy fans hearts racing. 1968 rolls around, Motion Performance expands his offering into another four Chevy models, the Chevelle, Nova, Biscayne, and Corvette. Shore turns up the heat again and dubs the line the Fantastic Five. No relation to the obscure Marvel comic book that included the Human Torch, Miss Fantastic, Thing, Psylord, and Big Brain. It's real. Look it up. Of the five, the Biscayne seemed to have the most subdued styling of the bunch. Everything I've seen seems to show a rather factory looking car on the exterior, but under the skin, the motion performance treatment was there. Four speed, Posi rear, F41 suspension with sway bars, and 427 badging, this sleeper came in at $2,998, the cheapest of all motion offerings. Now of course, there was a host of other add-ons and performance goodies to be had that could easily push the price up to $5,000 on most motion cars, but the fact that one could be had for as little as $2,998 is amazing. Now while the Fantastic Five were amazing on their own, I think Motion Performance was primarily known for their Corvettes. The first Phase 3 GT Corvette was built out of a 1968 Corvette. Joel looked to Europe for his inspiration on the design. He ditched the pop-up lights and instead recessed them into the fenders and covered them with plexiglass. Subtle fender flares were added and the shark grills were reversed so they stuck out versus being recessed and added a honed overdrive. He also took out the factory rear window and made the first Fastback C3 Corvette. Why? Well, it fit his dog, a couple giant Newfoundlanders. Starting in 1969, Motion Performance began to build the Phase 3 GT Corvettes to order. And up until 1971, when production stopped, between 10 and 13 were produced, three of which are known to survive today. The Phase 3 GT Corvettes weren't cheap though. Unlike the Biscayne, which could be had for 3000 One of these Phase 3 GT Corvettes was sold and shipped to Los Angeles in 1970 for 13000 That would be equal to $90,000 today. For that price, you can get a car with a 454 cubic inch V8 making 535 horsepower, did 0 to 60 in 4.4 seconds, and had a top speed of 150 miles per hour when tested. But that was a lot of money for a car in 1970. The radical Corvette designs didn't stop there. Joel wanted to do his own version of the 1965 Mako Shark 2 concept car by GM. Dubbed the Mako Shark, M-A-C-O, to avoid conflict with GM, he used many of the same cues, from the rear window louvers, to the hood, and pronounced fenders. After the Mako came the Manta Ray, a design style that combined aspects of both the GT and the Mako. It was only offered in 1973 and three were built. The last of the Shark Corvettes built by Rosen and Motion Performance was the one-off Moray Eel. More Mako Shark in appearance than the others, this one is my favorite 
because it was probably the cleanest looking of all. It has the same pronounced fenders, but the headlights were recessed and located in the grille to give it a real clean and classic look to the front. And last but not least, the Can-Am Spider, based on John Greenwood's 1974 IMSA wide-body race car. Powered by a 466 cubic inch V8, this monster made 550 horsepower. Four of these were built, one red with white stripes and three yellow ones. Now while the Corvette might be the ideal platform to build a car on for Joel, the Chevy Vega had to be the most odd. Why are these cars smiling? Because they're Vegas. And Vegas are very happy cars. They enjoy their work. They enjoy being driven. That's one thing that sets Vega apart from the average little car. Vega for 1973. More smiles per gallon than the average little car. For about the same kind of money as an average little car. Just because it's better, doesn't mean it's more. Launched in 1971, the Vega was designed to be an economical car during the end of the muscle car era. You know when the EPA started to crack down on big cubic inches, big horsepower, and soon to come oil embargo of 1973 that put the final nail in the coffin? This subcompact two-door came from the factory with an uninspiring inline four-cylinder that made 110 horsepower and a whopping 138 pounds-feet of torque. Joel wasted no time with these lightweight cars though. The inline fours were ripped out and they started with mainly 350 V8 swaps. In 1973, after getting many requests, Joel finally did the 454 swap into a Vega. Given this car was built with an inline four, the big block V8 required a few modifications and a shoehorn to make it fit. Rushing to get the swap done, the car was featured in the January 1974 edition of Carcraft. The article was titled, King Kong is living on Long Island. The first paragraph set the tone for the rest of the article and it went like this. The title sounds like bunk you say? Well, what would you call a street Vega with a 454 cubic inch big block? Aunt Mary? That certainly might be foolhardy, especially behind the wheel. You'd have to whisper, because if the Vega heard, it might get mad and snap your neck at the next traffic light. Now, the car wasn't without its faults. After all, it was a prototype. But it was estimated to run high 11 and would shred its tires easily. Now this sounds all fine and dandy to any car guy or girl. Who can't get behind a tiny compact with a massive V8. But this edition of Carcraft set off alarm bells at the Department of Justice. After an investigation, motion performance was served a summons citing the Clean Air Act of 1970. With fines up to $10,000 per emission device removed, motion performance could potentially face up to $50,000 in fines per vehicle. Joel figured that due to the amount of coverage motion performers received in magazines at the time, that the government figured they were bigger than they were and wanted to make an example out of them. It doesn't seem like too much of a stretch when you think about it. If you look at the production numbers for the Corvettes, it doesn't exactly scream high volume. And we know that Martin Shore featured their cars often in Cars Magazine. Either way, not having the means to fight a long drawn out battle against the government, motion performance settled in 1975, agreeing to a $500 fine and a cease and desist order on building new motion performance cars. Cut off at the knees, motion performance carried on building customer supplied donor cars for both domestic use and export. Unfortunately though, all domestic cars came with a disclaimer that stated, this vehicle does not comply with DOT and EPA regulations and is for off-road use only. As motion performance moved into the 80s, Joel struggled to produce monster cars that wouldn't attract the attention of the Justice Department. According to Martin Shore's book, Tales of a Muscle Car Builder, Joel was looking to avoid another V8 Vega debacle. The business pivoted to focus more on the fiberglass parts side, 
making wings, spoilers, and ground effects kits for cars. There were still a few street monsters that were able to fly under the radar though. In 1984, Joel built a supercharged 1983 Camaro with over 400 horsepower, upgraded suspension and body enhancements reminiscent of the Corvettes of the 70s. Three 1984 Phase 3 Camaros were built and sold for an astounding $24,995, more than twice the cost of a new one with an MSRP of around $10,000. After the Camaros, a series of Monte Carlos were built around 1987 powered by supercharged 350 V8s but they would be the last motion cars built in Baldwin, New York. So when did it all end? Well, I haven't been able to nail down a date when the close sign went up for the last time. But after speaking to Martin, he told me the business just dried up and Joel decided to retire sometime in the early 90s. Just like that, over 30 years of car history was over. But wait, there's more. In 2005, the gang got back together again. Martin, Joel, and a friend did a brief reboot of Baldwin Motion, bringing a few high-powered American muscle cars back. 700 horsepower 69 Camaro that was built by them and Phil Somers sold for 486,000 at the 2006 Barrett Jackson auction in Scottsdale, Arizona. There was also the Super Speedster and a series of fifth gen Camaros which I believe ended in and around 2011. Either way, I may be wrong, but it seems that after this brief reboot, the high performance car building days were over for good this time. After that, Joel settled into his high-end custom model building business, Motion Models, where he's built some amazing high-end models for museums and former presidents. Martin kept busy writing a series of books covering the muscle car era and running a blog called The Car Guy Chronicles in between his PR projects. So there you have it guys, that's the full motion performance story. Sorry it took a while to get to episode two, uh, just been busy working on the car, but I hope you guys enjoyed it. I wanna give a special thank you to Martin Shore who took the time to answer a bunch of questions and sent me some of the stock photos I used in the video. It was a great help. As always, if you like this video, please like and subscribe. It goes a long way to helping the channel. And uh, share the video amongst your friends. Hopefully we'll have some more uh, Charger videos up for you soon. And get some more work done on the actual car I'm working on. So until the next one guys, take it easy and I'll see you then.